It's the morning of February 23rd, 2009. We're at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. We're here for the Thomas H. Kane archive of the Rutgers program on the governor. I'm Michael Aaron of NJN News. This morning we're going to talk to Tony Ciccatello. Tony goes way back with Tom Kane, perhaps 35, 36 years. Uh, he was a close advisor to the governor in his early runs for office. He's on, long been considered part of Kane's kitchen cabinet. He never actually served in the Kane administration, but was always close to the center of the Kane action, or so it appeared. We'll find out what the reality is. Tony, where are you from? From Youngstown, Ohio. And how did you get to New Jersey? And when? <laughs> Actually, um, I went to Ohio State University, got a scholarship to go to Ohio State, and went down there and actually ran a campaign in between my uh, undergraduate and graduate school program. Then I went on for my PMA, or the, what is it, uh, public administration uh, degree, uh, master's degree in public administration from, actually at that time it was at the business school. So you had the benefit of business programs with the government programs, and it was very, very good. But I wanted to go to Washington. So I went down and interviewed at OMB. And <clears throat> I actually had two interviews, one in the health area and one in the transportation area. And I was basically going to go in one of those departments uh, for OMB. But it no sooner had I took some time to just relax after graduate school, never having a vacation all that time, uh, took a little trip around the country, uh, they put a freeze on. So I lost my job at OMB, and a friend of mine asked me if I'd come work for him, and it was, at, uh, it was a lobbyist for uh, Grocery Manufacturers of America. And so I became a lobbyist for, for a period of time, and I was very good in at Washington. it in Washington, D.C. Huge uh, trade association, represented 13% of the GMP. But I got frustrated because you... Did you say you were very good at it? I was good at lobbying. They liked me. And, and they were... They, uh, they, they pushed me and gave me incentives to stay and all this sort of stuff. But I would get frustrated because no sooner had I put in four changes to a piece of legislation than there were four more added that were worse than the four that I had taken out. So I got frustrated. And a friend of mine called me and said, just when I was at my frustrated peak... What year? This was 1974, and he said, um, he said, I have a, a guy in New Jersey I want you to meet. Uh, he's running for, for Congress. And I said, yeah, just give me a plane ticket. I'm ready to go. I didn't even know who it was. So I came up and I, I met this guy named Tom Kane. And we talked for like three hours. He liked me and I liked him. I liked his philosophy. And he was, he was supposed to have an uncontested primary and fairly safe congressional seat. But this was 1974. This was just at the peak of the Watergate scandal. So <clears throat> I decided to quit my job in Washington and come up and work with Tom. No sooner had I got up here, which was about six weeks before the primary, Millicent Fenwick got in the race. So now I had a contested primary, and one where she had a majority of the district and Kane was in a very small part of the district. So I decided to stay, and, and uh, I had no choice, actually, because I had quit my job in Washington. Came up here and ran his campaign for Congress, and we lost by 76 votes. Let's go back a second. Uh, you say you ran a campaign back in Ohio. Yes. A congressional campaign? No, it was a gubernatorial campaign. I was the uh, scheduler, actually. It was one of these, it was one of these campaigns that... Uh, um, it was very, un very uncharacteristic of, of Ohio because they usually, they had a very strong Republican Party and they usually picked the candidate. But it was coming after eight years of, of Jim Rhodes. And they decided, this was 1970, they decided to open it up and so there were five candidates. And my candidate ended up winning the primary. But then there was this huge scandal that occurred back then. <laughs> Uh, it had to do with uh, a sinking fund problem, and uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer just went crazy on the issue and created a sort of a negative environment. But I ended up staying through the whole congressional, the whole gubernatorial ca uh, campaign. Uh, 
And that's where I got initiated into politics. Had never any idea that I was going to be in politics at all. I really want, I liked government and I knew I wanted to work in government, but I ended up doing the campaigns as opposed to going into government. Republican candidate? Yeah, I worked for Robert Kennedy, believe it or not, <laughs> in 1968. But, um, and I had, I had, that's when you were in college and you were very altruistic. And then I sort of went through a, a mental, uh, um, just evaluation, what I liked, what I didn't like, and, and also, <clears throat> just the people I met in the Republican Party were just exceptional. The, the people that I talked with, the people that I worked with were exceptional and they had more of an influence on me than, than a lot of real hard party politics. You said that when you were in Washington, a friend of yours called and said, there's someone I want you to meet up in New Jersey. Who was the friend? His, it was Mark Haroff who um, had a firm in Washington named Smith and Haroff who did campaigns and he periodically would call me, he says, you got to do more campaigns, you know, you're good at that, all this sort of stuff, you know, yeah, just, just wanting to get me to do a campaign because he had a campaign that needed a campaign manager. But he caught me at a time when I was very frustrated with Washington and all that was going on there and I decided to take a, you know, sort of take a, a leap of faith, came up and met Tom Kane, I just liked him and decided to come. You said you liked his philosophy. Yeah. What was his philosophy at the time? What did you like? Well, he was, he was unique in, 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 uh, in, in terms of the politics back then. He was very much uh, into the issues and uh, the period of the time, the, the economic problems that were going on, the, 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 I mean, at that time Nixon was trying just about everything price controls, all these different things were going on in, in Washington that were bizarre for, for Republicans and, and also for the country as a whole. Uh, so we had a lot of good, hard discussions about what government should be doing, the Great Society programs, what was working, what wasn't working. His philosophy was, it was very much, I think, who he is. He's very moderate, um, fiscally conservative but also moderate in the various programs. I mean, his very first piece of legislation that he passed as, a, as an assemblyman was the uh, educational, uh, educational Opportunity Act, which was a direct relationship uh, to, the, to the, uh, all the, uh, um, um, what happened in the 60s, the... Uh, civil rights one? Yes, the civil rights, no, actually the, the, the riots that occurred in 67 out of Newark. People don't realize that Tom Kane's district, when he became an assemblyman, started from the central ward of Newark and went all the way out to Short Hills and Livingston, so, and where, he, where he lived, which was in Livingston. But he had the central ward. That helps explain why he did so well with African American voters <coughs> in the 80s. It, it, it laid the groundwork because Mary Smith, I mean, a lot of these people, these names you wouldn't know, but a lot of them were a part of that, that post-riot period that were active in the community. And Kane felt that the way to solve some of these problems was really through education. Uh, the Kerner Commission report on civil disturbances was uh, also around that period mm -hmm. of time. You think he was responding to it to some degree? I don't recall all the details of that report, but but I do remember, I do remember that. I think that I think Kane had his own particular approach. That he he yes he responded to some of those things, but I think he knew Newark better than people uh, people would have expected. Did you know at the time that his family had a rich history in public life in the state? Yes, when I came up when I came up to meet him. Uh, I got a little pro a little profile that was given to me by the guy who asked me to come up to, for the campaign, and he gave me a little history of the family and a l little bit about uh, what was going on in the past as well as currently. I mean, his father was still active politically in the party. I mean, I I remember that uh, um, Attorney General Richardson had just stayed at the home. I mean, there were all these things going on during the Nixon administration and the Keynes were still active and involved. Did in, you in meet part. his father? Oh, yes. His oh, father yeah. was a congressman. Father was a congressman. But he, w was he still a congressman in 74? No, 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 no. no. 1950. Former, con former con congressman. But he was still active in party politics and he still stayed in touch with things in Washington. What was he like, the father? 
He, in, in many ways, he was, he was very much like Tom. I mean, he was thoughtful, sincere, took time to learn the issues. Um, he, he did not like the fact that uh, Tom was considering a run for governor. Uh, he always wanted Tom to be the United States Senator from New Jersey. These are the things, I mean, he and I got very close. Robert Kane. Yes, Robert Kane. He and I got very close basically because one of the unique things, uh, one of my responsibilities in the campaign was actually to go and ask the father for, for contributions. Uh, the son obviously sometimes just couldn't do it and didn't feel like he should do it, so I would go ask the father. So we would sit down and talk about what he was doing. I asked him for contributions in the uh, congressional race as well as uh, when he ran for Congress or when he ran for governor. All right, so you moved to New Jersey because you like this politician, Tom Kane, who's what, about 15 years older than you? Yeah, he is. That's exactly what he is. Yeah, he's 19. Actually, actually 12 years old. 12, 12 years, years older. older. Yeah. And uh, you think you're going to have an uncontested primary, and then Millicent Fenwick. What was she at the time? Uh, at the time, she was she was the head of consumer affairs in the state, and she had such a great reputation. She was coming. She was part of a Republican administration, which was at that time the Cahill administration. He had put her in as Consumer Affairs. She didn't realize that when a Democratic administration comes in, people leave, uh, or at least have the courtesy to submit their resignation, and then they put new people in. Well, she wasn't going to leave, but uh, Brendan asked her to resign at that time, and, and she was she couldn't believe that. And then they, half of the people in the county said, uh, Somerset County in particular, people who had already asked Tom Kane to run for Congress. I mean, a lot of the people had Peter Freelingheisen. Uh, at that time, the, the chairman of the, the Somerset County Republican, all of them had told, encouraged Tom Kane to run for Congress. Whose seat was it? Who was holding the seat? Peter Freelingheisen. It was his seat. It was, was his seat. Retiring. He was retiring. And it was a Republican district. Oh, solidly Republican. It started in Livingston and and Short Hills, went through the southern part of Morris County and all of Somerset County, and then it had a little bit of Mercer County. It had Princeton and few towns down there. And was Kane a sitting assemblyman? At the time? Yes. Was he an assembly leader at the time? He had just left. I mean, because Brendan had won. Uh, in with the historic victory that he had and brought in at that time, he brought in 66 Democrats into the assembly. Tom won and barely won at that time in, in the assembly in a, in a safe district. But he went from speaker, he went from speaker of the assembly to minority, minority leader in, in a matter of a year. And so those things, those things change your perspective uh, after having been in power like he was as speaker of the assembly uh, all of a sudden he's now he's now minority leader and not only minority leader minority leader of 14 i mean that is uh, not only did they have a veto proof assembly i mean they could have done anything they wanted and never, never even considered the republicans there who were the key republican leaders or bosses in the district back then that you recall uh, John Renna uh, was still was was active as the as the county chairman of Essex. Essex, right? You're saying Republican leaders. Republican leaders in the congressional district who you had to appeal to if you were going to be the nominee. Uh, Luke Gray down in Somerset County, Morris County was was pretty wide open. That that is what is considered an open county. The county chairman has has a role, but but not that much. Uh, and the Essex County was John Renna, and also um, John Entile. Some of those people that have been there for a long time, we we had to make some uh, courteous discussions with various people in in the county, and and made sure that we touched all bases. 1974, right, um, was the year of this election. That's right. It was also, I believe, the year that uh, Nixon left office. Yes, is that, correct? that was correct. the Watergate. Summer of 74. Summer of 74. What impact did Watergate have on 
this election? So, oh, just tremendous. It's different, if I can bring it back to, to um, today, um, the election in 2009, if this is relevant, the election in 2008, was so dramatic economically. Watergate was an emotional election. I mean, there was this feeling of this guy is corrupt, he's a liar. I mean, there were all these things around the president, but it didn't filter down deep into the populace as it did, as, it, as 2008 did with the economy in such a difficult situation. But, 2000, uh, but two, uh, 1974, there was just this, I want ev these people out of office, they all look like crooks. If you had an R, if you were an R, if there was an R beside your name, you ran away from it. But now, in, this was the primary that we did. It, it was June, but it still was all the Watergate. It was very much going to be a part of the campaign, and everybody had to deal with that, and the Democrats were, were playing to that, that issue. Who were they putting up? God, you know, I can't okay. even I can't even remember. Do you recall what Tom Kane said about Watergate and Richard Nixon in the primary campaign? Basically, that issue we all played as it was evolving. You you encouraged more openness. I mean, you wanted the investigation to go forward. What was going on in Washington was basically what people were saying. I mean, as a Republican, all you can say is that, you know, let's get to the truth. And whatever the truth may be, let's get to it. Why did Millicent Fenwick win the primary? Basically, the discipline, back then, the discipline of the county vote. If you looked at the tallies, um, Tom, which in the Morris County d parts of, of the district, won those. He won practically every, every municipality except for maybe one, the one that was closest to Somerset. All of Somerset County was, was, it was a machine back then. Luke Gray ran it. He got the vote out. I mean, there were and some... she was a Somerset County She was person. a Somerset... And he was an Essex County person. He was an Essex County person. See, the interesting thing about the Canes, the Canes come from an aristocratic family, but they were not part of that Somerset aristocratic crowd. The crowd of the Dillons and, and the, and, and the um, uh, Fenwicks and, and the Freelinghuisens, the Keynes stayed in Essex County. That was sort of like another world to the political, to that little political machine down there, which was much more controlled. That was the Essex County machine is different than the Somerset County machine. It's, it's, it's the money crowd really controlled that. Essex County, it was, it was tougher. You had Newark to deal with. You had, you had other aspects of, of uh, political life, broader issues. What was the Kane money based on? It came, back from, it came from utilities primarily, but it went all the way back to railroads as well. Um, that's where it started, but it, it, it filtered in through the utility business, both what gas and water. What were the styles of uh, Kane and Fenwick as campaigners back then? It was the most genteel campaign. Uh, I mean, I was just, you know, I didn't have much hair and I was pulling it out then. And it was just the kind of thing that, you know, I think the public would, would have enjoyed. It was basically two people saying how much they respected each other and how they enjoyed this debate on the issues because this is, this is what needs to be done in politics. It was just one of these incredibly uh, fun campaigns if you, were, if you were a person listening because you had people debating the issues, genuinely debating the issues and having differences of opinion, even as Republicans. But it was genteel, no, no backbiting, no heavy fighting, all the, the backroom stuff that I had to deal with as the campaign manager, dealing with the party people and the county chairman, both in Essex, Morris, and, and the others. That's a, that was a little rougher, but you know, we, we tried to break through the, the Somerset controlled environment by staging little things, uh, having Kane's name p appear at certain things that s surprised them. They didn't, they didn't stand for any of that stuff back then. So it's, it was a different ball game than it is now. I mean, it was much more controlled, and Luke Gray knew how to run a, cam knew how to run a county. Who was Luke Gray? 
Luke Gray was a longtime chairman, Republican chairman of, of Somerset County, who always controlled, matter of fact, always had a little money in his back pocket that he can spend whenever he needed it. And it was because he would go into the, into the horse country area and, and get the money that he needed to run the party. I mean, they wanted a certain genteel environment in that area, and they got what they wanted in, 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 the, in that county. And, and it's a very, very well-run county. And it also has some very good public officials that they bring to the forefront. There were some Republican congressmen at the time supporting uh, Richard Nixon, uh, Maraviti, Sandman. Right. Uh, do you recall whether Tom King criticized them? No. He, I mean, Marazzini was in Morris County as well, and part of the district that we, uh, the northern part of Morris County. He was not critical of them. I mean, it was, it, you know, as it got, if he had gotten by the primary in June and, and went into the general election, then there might have been a little more contention. But Marazzini uh, stayed with the president all the way to the very end even when it became apparent that uh, some impeachment would take place. Well, was it a close primary, do you recall? For? Fenwick and King. Oh, yeah, 76 votes. Oh, 76 votes. Yeah. It was, it was you know, we, we had just tremendous turnout in Essex County, but we only had two towns. The Morris County section was very solid for Kane. And it was just Somerset County. Just there, there were some districts in, in Somerset County where Tom would get three votes out of you know 50 cast. So what posture did he assume upon defeat in the primary? Well, you know, this was a turning point I think for Tom, and it was it was the for me I, as I look back, I think his whole perspective changed, where his focus was Washington. After this defeat, he became a lot more uh, introspective and in the sense of what he wanted to do in, in, in Trenton. He was still minority leader. He still, had, um, he still had a term to finish up there, and he wanted to go on and do some things in the state. Both of his boys, his, the twin boys, were six years old at the time, and Debbie was pregnant with Alexandra. And <clears throat> at that time, he just his focus was Washington. But it shifted because he knew he wasn't going to Washington now and, Phil, and, and uh, Millicent en ended up winning the district and winning the congressional seat and went on to serve, I think, about five terms, um, eight, four terms, and then she ran for the United States Senate. But he knew that that was no longer an option because it was a safe congressional seat and it, his towns would probably never get moved around that much. They would probably stay in that district. So his focus shifted to to New Jersey. And in doing that, and, and because the boys were six at the time and started school, and he knew from, his from the days when he was in school, the, the, having to go to school on your own, the, the separation of the family from, from you as a child and growing up, he didn't want that for his kids. He went to private school and he literally got on a train in, in, and would go up to Massachusetts and that's where he went to school and would come back to Washington. It was a different time. The period that he went to school, he was born in 35 uh, and he was, he was practically, he was going to school during the war period and, and also uh, the post-war period. So that's when he was in private school. But there, and the, and, the, and the Congress at that time would go down to Washington and basically his parents would stay, they had a home down there, and they would stay in Washington because you didn't have the back and forth. But the dislocation in the family he didn't want. He wanted to keep his family together. So with the boys reaching co school age, I feel that his focus shifted to New Jersey. And that's when everything became more New Jersey. He didn't want them to uproot them, go down to Washington. And uh, we've talked about it a little bit. And, and, and he kind of agrees. But I think if something had come up, he might have, take, he might have considered uh, Washington again. But I think his focus became more New Jersey. He continued to serve in the legislature until when? 1977. Seventy-seven. He mm -hmm. chose that year to, to run. run for governor. What, what was your, uh, 
What was your role with him after he lost the primary? What was your relationship? Basic, well, I got a job here in New Jersey, uh, and I went to work for for Merkin Company for uh, in in uh, their Rawway offices, and I decided to stay. I mean, my focus changed too. I mean, I decided that I didn't want to get into all of this political running around the states and doing campaigns for people that I didn't know. I had to believe in the candidates that I wanted to work for. I had to. I had to have a personal connection, and so I decided that um, I decided that I would stay with him and work with him. Sort of like take a gamble, in the sense of if you're going to do something in in public life, go with someone that has the ideals and has the values that you that you find. Don't go trying to search around the political world just go with so you know I know who he is I know what he what he stands for those are the things that I want to stay with so I decided to stay with him and I continued to work with him uh, at Merck I was able to I was able to work my job and then do things for him at night how'd you get your job at Merck that w that was at that time Merck was very uh, just starting government affairs and they had no government affairs department. They didn't even have somebody that would go down to Trenton. Um, back then, Merck was a proprietary drug maker. They only made drugs that they manufactured, that they actually discovered. So they didn't have a lot of issues. But all of a sudden, generics became an issue. And legislatures all around the country were starting to talk about generic drugs as a way of reducing costs. And Merck, being a proprietary drug maker, needed to begin to educate the public about what is a generic drug as opposed to a proprietary drug. And matter of fact, they hired me. Uh, they hired me before they actually hired the top guy. I was young at the time, but they needed somebody in the state. So they hired me, and, and that's how I got the job. It was purely, I went around. Tom had recommended to me, he said, you know this this state has a lot of drug companies he says you should go and interview with the various drug companies because I had Washington experience I mean I had that on my resume so I could go around to these companies and say I have I have some experience in government affairs and I understand corporate life uh, because I was representing uh, really all the big manu manufacturers of food Procter & Gamble General Mills General Food those were all the companies that I represented when I was in Washington so I had the corporate experience along with uh, the government experience. And this job enabled you to keep a hand in with Tom Kane, uh, right? As a as a what? As an advisor? As, as an advisor, I basically we would, you know, periodically I'd go visit, I'd travel with him, hear him speak, uh, comment. We would always talk about different issues, where things are going. And I got the job at Merck in 1974. <clears throat> the whole presidential campaign uh, started up around 75, and and that was, you know, that was the time that uh, you know Ford was in office. He had just pardoned Nixon, so it was you know stirring up 1975. That was the emergence of Ronald Reagan. So you had you had a lot of rumbling within the Republican Party at that time, and. Tom's father, Congressman, the former Congressman Bob uh, Kane, was very close to Jerry Ford, so there there was a lot of interplay with the president at the time, and and that's where we decided to sort of help the president as he was coming into his election. Tom sat down with me and he said, you know, do you, what do you think of the presidential election? And I said, at that time, I said I thought the economy was moving in the right direction. Uh, if you remember, I mean, the, sev the early part of the 70s was a very, very difficult time for this country. Not only w did we have Watergate and a presidency that was always sidetracked with uh, extraneous issues as opposed to the economy, also experimenting with a lot of different things, but you also had the embargo. You had the Arab oil embargo and you had all these things playing into an economy. It was a really tough economy. But all of a sudden, I, f I felt that the president was going to be the beneficiary of the economy starting to move out, and he was. 
and the economy did start coming out in 75 and emerging in 76. I want to ask you about the 76 campaign in a minute, but uh, going back, uh, did do you, do you recall if Kane's father had any reaction to his losing the primary or any advice to his yeah. son? Yeah, he was very disappointed. Uh, matter of fact, I'd learned a lot about him at that time because um, those old-time congressmen really knew their numbers. They could sit and they can look at those districts and know exactly the numbers that they needed. And as we saw the numbers coming out of Livingston and Short Hills, he knew that there was the chance that he could win. And when we, but he also knew that there was that problem down there in Somerset County. And if that plurality, if the plurality that we were getting out of Essex, those two towns in Essex, would offset the uh, pluralities that uh, would, the, the huge differences that would occur down in Somerset County. And they, we almost did. We won, we did well in Morris County, which was surprising to a lot of people. In, in, in fact, that Kane um, took, took a good bit of uh, uh, Morris County, all the towns in Morris County except for one. But it was, it was understanding those numbers, how they knew them. They knew, they could tell by, by the calls that were coming in and the numbers that they were getting, whether things were going right or wrong. He was very disappointed. He wanted Tom in that, in that Congress. Uh, you say that Tom shifted his focus to state politics because now the congressional seat was filled by a Republican and looked like it would be. Uh, how do you think that sat with Robert Kane? Well, I think that's when he and I would talk a lot. And I said, you know, uh, Mr. Kane, I always uh, referred to him as Mr. Kane, and, and I said, you know, that Tom has these, he has good instincts for this state. And it was just something you could watch and see. The very first speech I heard Tom Kane give, I, I, I didn't know who he was. I came up here, to, I was, came up to New Jersey in seven, 1973 to speak to the New Jersey Food Council. We had all of this legislation, very complex legislation in Washington at the time, had to do with nutrition labeling, um, discard, you know, having putting dates on when you could let go of things, when things should be stored. All the states were doing different things. They were requiring all this different information on, on food containers. So I came up to, I came up to here um, I had to advise basically the executive committee of the food council and ask them for support. They said, why don't you stay for dinner and then go back? And I said, fine. So I listened to a spe the speaker of the assembly. His name was Tom Kane. And back in Washington at that time, we were all reading uh, David Halberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest. And here I'm sitting in this, I'm sitting in this New Jersey food council meeting and this guy is talking about, very articulate, talking about the best and the brightest. I'm saying, you yeah, know, New Jersey. But the, the, the interesting thing of that, of that whole speech is that he used the one example that is probably the one that's used most often, uh, where Lyndon Johnson goes back to Sam Rayburn, and he talks about his first cabinet meeting. And he basically says, God, Sam, you know, you should see all these people, the president of American Motors, the dean of this school, that school. And Sam Rayburn looked at Lyndon and said, you know, Lyndon, I just wish one of them had run for sheriff. Now, that story, you know why he told that story? Because there was a sheriff in the, in the audience that I didn't know about. I asked him about that afterwards. And he said there, the county sheriff was in the office, in the audience. It just shows the man. How do he, he show that he has a good he political feel? He has a feel? good political feel, knows his audience, knows exactly, and he's always on message. All this, I remember after Tom got into office, and, and you probably knew, and I know that a lot of people looked at Tom as he, he wasn't a good speaker. They said, oh, he went to classes. We never sent him to any classes. We never did any of that stuff. I mean, he talked funny, and half the time I didn't hear that. Every once in a while I would hear a rolled out R every now, but I, you know, it was New Jersey, so I didn't, everybody talks funny in New Jersey. I thought, being from Ohio, I thought everybody was, was uh, had a little accent. But the thing is, 
is he knew he, he first of all he had to understand speaking because he did have that stuttering problem that he had to work his way through and not only the stuttering problem as a child as a child right. as a child but what it did for him basically was he he also understood music he understood breathing and singing because he was a big opera fan and if you listen to Tom Tom speaks really down from the deep part of his of, of his uh, vocal in, in his uh, chest and basically it's that it's that baritone voice that he has that comes out of of, of understanding both music and overcoming that 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 ability to stutter and he, every once in a while he'll stutter he'll go back into that basically because he just he's too anxious to make a make a comment but he slowed his speech down he comes out very strong and he has a nice big baritone voice and that speak I mean his 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 speaking is always in my opinion has always been right there but he also understands his audience and knows it. One time I asked him to come in for to speak at a group and it was sort of a nothing event. It was the 150th anniversary of McCarter in English. And he came in and gave one of the nicest speeches and I don't know who did the work on it. I sent some information down because McCarter, there were many McCarters involved in politics in New Jersey over the years. They started PSENG, one of the McCarter brothers, and, one, and started the law firm and all that. Well, he made this wonderful speech, and one of the lawyers came up to me and said, you know, this guy's always on. And that's how Tom Kane was. The state of New Jersey got a governor for eight years who was always on. And by that I mean he worked like no other governor I've ever seen. I mean, I, I only know a few governors, and I, the one in Ohio that I, that the candidate that I worked with was very much the same way a real hard-working guy but I used to tell I used to ask Debbie uh, does he sleep because I could tell I would sometimes I would have things with him when he was up early and when he's up early his eyes don't open up he looks Chinese is uh, because he's basically uh, he's, he's not a morning person he's much more of an evening person um, but I, I, I asked her, does he sleep? And she says, no, he was working until 2, 3 in the morning. He could, he could work on 3, 4 hours sleep, and I, and I don't know how he did it. And I used to complain with Carrie Edwards. I don't want to, uh, we could probably get to this later on. I complained to Carrie. I said, Carrie, your memos are too, Tom would show me his homework. And, I mean, the memos were just this thick. I said, I, I would say to Carrie, you're going you're gonna to kill the guy. And he, and he would say, come here. So one time I went into Kerry's office and he brought out, he took Tom's briefcase out and you would go through the memos and on page 32 there would be changes. And you would just say, you know, what's he doing reading all this stuff? He was a very much a speed reader and I used to watch him go through books. We would sit on the beach up at uh, Fisher's Island and literally read books in a couple of days. Big thick books. We were, I remember one summer we were into Edmund Morris's uh, uh, biography on Teddy Roosevelt. They had a couple of volumes. You'd read simultaneously the same books? We were reading the same books, but it could never keep up with them. Fisher's Island, uh, the family had a house on Fisher's Family, Island. yeah. It ba that basically, those were a lot of Debbie's friends, uh, a lot of people from, from Delaware settled on Fisher's Island as a, as a summer home. And there were a lot of Debbie's friends. I don't think I don't know if. What's Debbie's sto story? What's Debbie Debbie Kane's background? How did he meet Debbie Kane? Actually, um, it was it was arranged. I think it was you know somebody wanted to introduce him. You know, just sort of like I have a friend that I think we grade for that kind of thing. And I can't remember exactly. There was there was a, a Princeton party too where I think they met. And then they, and then Tom followed up when he found out she was from Delaware. Followed up, and and um, he had friends down. He had some relatives down there, and they went they went there, and um, that's where he actually he invited her over to the house or one of his relatives' house one time, and that's how it all started. Um. What was the statewide political landscape like? Uh, at the time that Kane lost the primary, what was what was going on? 
At that time, uh, it was it, it had changed so dramatically. I mean, we had come out of um, very strong Republican legislative years, and uh, there were very strong Democratic governors as well. But you had a Republican governor who was defeated after one term, uh, uh, Governor Cahill, which was you know in in four years in New Jersey, oftentimes you really can't get everything done. But because of that conservative element, because of the Sandman competition, all of that, the party was just in, in a shambles. Plus, not only the fight that was going on here in New Jersey, then you had Watergate to add to it. The party was broke. Basically, uh, Webster Todd, uh, Christy Whitman's father, was, was paying for the electric bills just to keep the state party open. And it was, it was everybody for themselves. Uh, and Tom, if, if he had won, uh, the congressional seat would have at least been a part of that leadership that was going to bring the party along. But when he decided to, when he lost that race and focused more on New Jersey, he did start to work with the party and bring, uh, bring more active participation and, get, and actually recruit people to run for office. Uh, from our interviews with Brendan Byrne archive, we know that the uh, debate over whether to impose a state income tax dominated uh, political life in the state during that period of time. Do you recall uh, how Tom Kane uh, positioned himself on that question? He was, he was very open and, and also um, he felt that it was the kind of issue that you had to let every legislator decide for themselves. I mean, he didn't push any particular way. But he was, he was also probably the best debater that the Republicans had in terms of going on television and doing different, different things. I remember he, uh, the, the Dick Leone debates with Tom Kane were, were exceptional. I mean, those were things to really listen those to. Those were on New Jersey Network. New Jersey Network, and they even, they even did uh, um, Channel 2 News. I remember going with Tom to Channel 2 when they... It was a big issue. It was a primary issue, and everybody... he eventually got to the point where I think he voted for a tax, uh, but he did not uh, push anybody or a party line in that particular way. He allowed the candidate, he allowed every individual member of the legislature to do what they wanted. All right. Uh, you say that Congressman Kane was close to President Ford, uh, and you and Tom Kane got involved in the New Jersey effort to reelect. President yes. Ford, mm -hmm. or to elect President Ford, he was never really elected. He wasn't elected, no. Um, what role did Tom Kane play in that presidential campaign? We he, we talked about it, and he, because his father was active with with the president, and also he was, to a great extent, at that time in 1970, in 1975, he was or 1976, he was basically the, he was the Republican leader, or one of the leaders, and also. He had the kind of uh, statewide perspective on issues because being the Speaker of the Assembly prior to being the Minority Leader, he was very active in getting around to the state and doing a lot of speaking. So he had a statewide perspective, and the was father. Was he the chairman of the no. Ford campaign? He w he became yes, he became chairman of the uh, committee to reelect President Ford. Um. Did he surrogate speak on behalf of Ford? Oh, yes. He was the campaign manager. Dick Cheney was our boss <laughs> at that time. And we, to a great extent, you know, he was the campaign Cheney manager. Cheney was managing the Ford campaign? He was the chief of staff. Chief of staff. He was the chief of staff. In the White House. In the White House, yeah. right. And, and I was the executive director. So we both basically... Did you, did you talk to Cheney? Oh, yeah. yeah. Periodically, when I needed money, <laughs> we would talk to the various... Uh, Cheney, and then there were also surrogates underneath him that we worked with. Was there a U.S. Senate election in '76 in this state? As yes, well? in 1976. There was that Harrison Williams. Harrison Williams. And David Norcross. David Norcross, right? Did Tom Kane get involved in that election? He did not. Why not? Well, because that was that was tr that was a tricky part of of dealing with the Ford campaign. Uh, Ford uh, periodically needed various votes and also knew Harrison, uh, Harrison Williams very well. So it was a real juggling act. And I, I've, it, it was difficult uh, to deal with basically because 
w there were opportunities that we could have we could have helped uh, Dave in terms of the campaign, but the White House didn't want certain uh, certain things to happen. So you you had to be very cautious in what you did and how you did it and who was in the room uh, when you did some things. Because Ford was here twice. Ford actually came twice and and uh, where? he was down in Atlantic City once and he was in uh, Union County. We went into Maddie Rinaldo's district. Um, Right, right in Union, right near Kane College. There, uh, we had uh, reception there. That was that time uh, in particular. Um, that time in particular, when he was in Union County, was right after he Ford had made that statement in the debate that you know Eastern Europeans were not under communist rule. So we had a lot of Polish people that we brought together to have Ford meet and also to. Calm them down. When it, when when a campaign is is on a moving, it gets a little bit of a rhythm, and if a candidate makes a mistake like that, everything sort of stops, and you have to reach out to the groups that you've normally would not speak to, bring them back in, and then get going again. It's 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 hard to explain, but you have those issues. And when Ford made that statement, we had to deal with that issue of Eastern Europeans and. Uh, and we were able to do that, and we brought him into Union County. Ford lost uh, the presidential election to Jimmy Carter. Who won New Jersey? President Ford, by 60,000 votes. I remember telling Tom back when we were thinking about it, I remember telling him that I personally don't think that this guy, this candidate, President Carter, this candidate, Governor Carter, uh, is going to sell in Jersey City or Hudson County. Uh, some of the talks like that is not necessarily going to uh, uh, really convince a lot of the labor guys that we know or we, the union guys that we understand, are going to go along with someone like that. Uh, may maybe it's a north south situation, I don't know, but it just it wasn't going to sell. So we actually, our campaign actually targeted a lot of what was going on. In Hudson County, Tom Kane or President Ford lost Hudson County by 22,000 votes, which was unheard of. That's a small margin small for a Republican. Small margin for a Republican. I mean, Hudson County, you know, Essex County, 40, 50, 60,000 votes. He also won Bergen County. President Ford won Bergen County by 60,000 votes. Um, did Nelson Rockefeller run against Gerald? Ford for the nomination that year, or no? He was he was. Or did he come into? He what was appointed. What was Rockefeller's relationship to Ford? At the time? He was appointed vice president. He was the vice president. Right, right. He was appointed, and that was the first. That whole law, that was the first time that the appointment process, you know, after a president steps down, that's when it, that law uh, was first first used, where the president, you know, when a vice president. The, the, Spiro Agnew left office in disgrace because of a scandal. So Nixon appoints for the first time a vice president. And that was the first time that law was actually used. And he appoints Gerald Ford, which was very well received. I mean, it was bringing somebody in from the people's chamber. So President Ford is there. And then Nixon goes through that whole thing. So he moves up and then Ford appoints Rockefeller. You're saying this was the first time an appointed vice president right. stepped up into the presidency right. prior to that elected vice president since then. Right. right. So Ford appointed Rockefeller vice president. Right. Um, and did Rockefeller campaign in New Jersey? He did not. He did not. It was Dole who came in. It was the ca candidate who came. But <coughs> Ro Rockefeller it, it came in. For smaller things, yes, he, he. Matter of fact, he did. I remember doing some actuaries uh, with him. Yeah, right. Um, I've, I've forgotten that, but he did come in for for certain events. But he, um, the issue was was in our case was really just making sure that that uh, that the the Ford people and and what we needed to do with the various ethnic groups, everything worked out. Along the lines that we had, we had scheduled, we had actually planned out with the, with the White House, and then the only thing that we had to worry about was really Hudson County and some of the Democratic counties. And when we felt that we have, were having an impact in those areas, we actually told a lot of the White House people to stay out, 
And a matter of fact, they were always upset with us because they never thought we had enough money to do what we needed to do. Uh, and I asked them for a little bit more money at the end of the campaign, but we didn't need that much. We just needed to continue to do what we were doing. Um, we were talking about Harrison Williams a moment ago. Uh, do you know what uh, Robert Kane's opinion of Harrison Williams was? Uh, <laughs> he had run against Williams for the Senate <laughs> yeah. at some point. What? What? Do you know, do you know what year they ran against? 1958. 58. Mm -hmm. So what did Kane think of? Kane Sr. think of uh, Williams. Yeah, not much. <laughs> um, he, uh, he never said a lot of, uh, he, he never got into a lot of specifics because he was, uh, he had lost that, that race. And there, there were a number of reasons. I mean, he, he didn't do a lot of things that he should have done. They took a lot of things for granted. Uh, this was uh, 1958 and, um, Eisenhower didn't do some things that they thought should have been done. I mean, there were a lot of things that were happening at that time that, uh, and he didn't run a good campaign from what I gathered uh, from among the party people. Uh, but I think he did not, he had, he didn't have much respect for uh, Harrison Williams when he, back then, and then when all of this, uh, he wasn't around, I don't think he was around when all of that took place, but it was truly, truly ironic to have the person who defeated his father uh, to have Governor Kane then appoint someone to fill the seat of Harrison Williams. When Harrison Williams got in trouble over the Abscam, Abscam thing. Scandal. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show you politics can go all the way around. Even though he lost at, uh, in 1958, his son was able to appoint somebody to, to fill the seat. Somebody from those Somerset County moneyed Republicans who you were talking about <laughs> yes. 45 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, who Tom was never really a part of. And most of those people Nicholas didn't. Nicholas Brady. Nick Brady. Most of those people didn't contribute to Tom when I was, when I was running those campaigns. It was, it was interesting for me. I, I would always tell Tom, these are your people. <laughs> You know, I'm saying, you know, it's, it's like me going into Youngstown, Ohio and going into certain wards. I mean, I would have expected some support there. And I would get, I would get this pushback from his people. And uh, I could never understand uh, some of the thinking that went along there. But you're saying they weren't really his people. No, they weren't. I've, when I step back to, real, to understand it, the Kings were unique, politically unique. They were not, you know, they didn't ride the horses. They didn't do all those things. They were very close to the Rockefellers and, and active politically uh, as the Rockefellers were, but they were not part of that. Was Tom uh, that said. friendly with Nelson Rockefeller? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if there was ever uh, anything that, uh, that he might have done in terms of, of national uh, Senate or anything like that, I think they would have been, a, been involved in, but he never felt he needed that. Okay, so Ford succeeds in New Jersey but fails nationally. Tom one of the Bain is still in the, go ahead. Now, one of the nice things, you know, that President Ford did, because we were the only eastern state that supported him and won, he invited us all down to the White House. So the, the, Back then, we had a very young staff. It was Greg Stevens, and we were basically all of us, except for Webb Todd's wife, Eleanor Todd, was my scheduler. <laughs> and she was in her 70s back then, I think, or late 60s, something like that. But we all went down to the White House, and he, he gave us an evening, uh, a day of uh, touring the White House, and he also Who do you recall us. going on that trip? Oh, it was, uh, there were 10 of us, um, myself. We all took the train down, uh, Greg Stevens. We have great pictures of that. Uh, John Le Boutelier. Um, some of the staff, I can't even remember their names because I had hired them. They were so young. Uh, Eleanor Todd. Eleanor Todd. And no, I can't remember okay. all that. But there and were Tom about 10. Kane. And Tom came. And Tom introduced each one of us when we went in the Oval Office, and we all had pictures, and we brought out, we brought with us 
Jerry, Jersey Loves Jerry sign, which he just loved. And you know, it was sad because when we had the tour of the White House, that I actually, believe it or not, this is sort of an inside story, everybody else went on a tour of the White House. I went in a back room and met with John Deardorff and Doug Bailey and basically started planning this, the campaign for the governorship. Really? Deardorff in and Bailey were what at the time? What was their Bailey role? and Deardorff were political consultants. consultants. And they were at the White House? They were at the White House. They had met. Well, they, they had worked with, uh, with the president. So we, we had a meeting in the back. Were there offices in the White House? No. no. Just, they have to back, be then, <laughs> back then it was a different, uh, different time. You could actually have political meetings in the White House. Uh, no, they were just there waiting for me. And uh, I went up in, uh, in one of the offices and we sat down and started talking about the campaign. So you're the... Uh, quintessential backroom guy. Right? <laughs> we started, I mean, it was, it was something that Tom didn't give me explicit uh, instructions on, on whether or not he wanted to leave the assembly. Uh, but this was 19, this was 1976. And uh, uh, I was just, at that particular point in time, I felt you know, he, I didn't think he wanted to stay in the legislature, but we didn't talk about it. But this was, this was December of 1976, and I was just getting, as, as I do, I quietly get my stuff together, talk with various people, and then see when he's ready to make a move. Uh, so it was uh, 11 months or 10 months before the next gubernatorial election. Right. Let's take a little break and uh, talk about that election. Okay. Uh, when we Resume. Okay. okay. Yeah, wherever you uh, want to stop. Yeah. We'll just stop okay. Good. Okay, good. Well, we'll see. We, 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 we can only do another 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, Michael. Roll. Tony, uh, we left off with the thoughts of a 77 run for governor mm -hmm. in your mind in the mm -hmm. White House. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back a bit uh, and Talk about Tom Kane's career in the Assembly mm -hmm. uh, as he prepares to present himself to the state in a gubernatorial primary. Uh, what are the highlights of his Assembly career? All right. Well, that's that's one of the strengths of, of Tom Kane. I thought he had probably one of the best careers in that 10-year period that he was in the, the Assembly from 68 to 78. He had Okay, he had practically uh, some of the some of the premier legislation that he had introduced. He introduced the legislation on the Department of Environmental Protection. He creating it. Creating it. Actually, creating a department. And you, you have to realize. I mean, he was there in 1968. I mean, that you know, back then the environment was not high on a lot of people's minds. So it was it was just coming into the fold, and it was the opportunity to begin the process of creating that department. He had major legislation in education. He always had issues in education. And he also had, <coughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know all the specifics in some of the, um, some of the economic development areas, but I mean, he was there on issues of, of taxation and also uh, credits for for different kinds of taxes for businesses and things like that. I mean, he had a good solid from a Republican's perspective. He had a good solid base. Uh, was ethics one of his issues? Yes, right yes, that was an issue. But it wasn't. Uh, you know, it came out of that Cahill period where you had you had a couple of the cabinet people that had problems, and there were some scandals there. But it, it basically had to do with. It, 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 it didn't get as broad the kind of uh, what I would call the kind of uh, awareness among the people that other things did. And environment, I think, was one of those things that he was really very solid in. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, whatever he did on ethics uh, was meant to set him off from Watergate. Primarily, yeah, primarily that that period it was it, it was more of um, you know that was an individual president that that was a, a, an act that was so so um, 
uh, in many respects, he was trying to control the government from within the White House. That's not the way government is supposed to work. Government has got to be out. You have to be. You have to provide the leadership, but the departments have to run the government, and you have to have the confidence and the controls. The White House, to a great extent, needs to be the assimilation of information, and in many respects, the reporting mechanism. But what what Nixon was trying to do, and which is which, which will actually happen to you, the bureaucracy will end up turning on you. You have to be able to provide leadership, but not necessarily try to control the government. Tom Kane have a mentor in the legislature. Do you know? You know the guy that I think would be able to speak directly to a lot of the things. The the the, the person that made and Tom Kane liked to model af, uh, model himself after was Rich, Richard DeCourt. And he w he died uh, unfortunately very very early in life. He got cancer and died. But Dick DeCourt was the guy that Tom respected the most, I think, in the legislature. He liked some of the personalities in the legislature, but it was DeCourt and his political acumen and how he presented himself that he he watched very carefully. DeCourt was from what county? Bergen County. Bergen County. Mm -hmm. how, how about enemies to the, in the legislature? Do you have any or, or rivals? I should <laughs> he always had Jimmy Walwork, uh, who who felt uh, uh, he was the senator uh, from his his district, and they were they never really talked that much, and there was always this sort of that was that was minor though, and Walwork was always concerned that he was going to run against him, and that was not the case. I and mean, Tom was happy where he was, and he was happy that uh, Jim Walwork worked very hard as a legislator. He wasn't he had nothing. Um, nothing really personal against him. It was just the fact that they're, they're competitive. He had some other legislators who he could hardly stay in the same room with, uh, but uh, he, he learned to, to deal with them. Um, if you, one covered Tom Kane later in his career, one inevitably heard about his deal with David Friedland oh, yeah. and the Hudson County Democrats yeah. to become speaker. Uh, Tell us that story. You weren't here at the time. I don't. Think. I wasn't here at the time. But no. uh, uh, it's portrayed as uh, Tom Kane's deal with the devil, or Tom right. Kane uh, showing what a hardball politician he can really be. How do you view uh, what happened there? I think you know it. It does show Tom's savviness. It doesn't necessarily mean hardball or anything like that. A lot of it was done by Dick DeCourt. The deal was actually made by Dick and pulled together by the Bergen County crowd. But, and Tom knew what was going on and understood. And also, if you look at what they dealt with, what the, the deal, whatever they gave to Friedman, that chairmanship, it, it really didn't have uh, the kind of impact that everybody, the political impact that everybody thought. Yes, they were, they were dealing with the devil, but they had to move the process forward and they dealt with it and they got something done. I think Tom, you know, the bottom line is that Tom is very results oriented and sometimes you know, the politics you have to, you have to understand and you can't compromise your principles, but you have to understand if you can move something forward, even in dealing with the devil, you, as long as he then controlled the legislature, he then controlled what went on that, what went on that board. So the controls were at his fingertips at that time. It was a delicate balance. Got, well, it wasn't easy, but those are the things that made Tom Kane the leader that he became as governor. All of that that he did in the legislature, from being assistant majority leader to majority leader to speaker of the assembly to minority leader, all of those things were the core that made Tom Kane the governor that he was. A conflict of interest laws uh, led to some legislators giving up seats for example, Robert Wilentz. Uh, do you think we've gone too far in that realm? I do. I mean, I, I'm i not sure, you know, what the balance is on this. I think we've gone too far in terms of the kind of money we spend on campaigns, and I don't know how you resolve that issue. Uh, I mean, look at, look at for, for governors. I mean, look at the unique aspect of what happened this year. In 2008, an individual who's not of great means was able to raise $750 million to run for president. I don't even know how that happens. 
here in New Jersey. Uh, Tom Kane, we never used a lot of his money, but we did have some of his money that we used for his campaign. And it was always a threat that the Keynes would use their money. But look at what John Corzine did and the kind of money that he spent. Money is, is a very big problem for politics in New Jersey, and that keeps people out a lot more than I think you know, the, the, the ethics issues. I think people who want to get into office, I think, can deal with the ethics issues, it's just, the, it's just raising the money and, and the process that you have to go through. That is the, the one single curbing thing I feel in politics in New Jersey, especially because of the lack of the ability to communicate in such an expensive market. Let's talk about the 77 gubernatorial campaign. Brendan Byrne is a one-term governor, uh, not uh, looking too strong for a second term. Uh, Tom Kane decides to run for governor. Had this been obvious for a couple of years, or uh, and had it been planned for a couple of years? Uh, no, this is this is another thing. I think this is a little insight that I think I can give you in in my experience with Tom. We we ran the Ford campaign for president in 1976. And I told him, Tom, if you want to run in 1977, we can use this as a basis for gathering the kind of support, whether it's county organizations, delegates, people who are active, whatever. No, no, no. It was all Ford, Ford, Ford. I can't afford, this is a tough fight, dealing with Reagan and coming in. The, peop the Reagan people actually... Reagan challenged Ford. Reagan challenged in Ford in 76. 76. And R Reagan looked at New Jersey very carefully, and they made a mistake. I mean, had they come in and did what they could have done in some of the other states, I think they would have been more effective. Now, Tom, quietly, to a great extent, without a lot of organization on my part, because at that time I was working at Merck. I had to take a leave of absence to do the Ford campaign in 1976, but at that time I didn't. But he himself stood on the phone and talked with each delegate. There were 65, 67 delegates for New Jersey, and he, we ended up getting 64 for Ford. But it was a really, you know, you weren't quite sure you had them all until the very end. And it was Tom who did that. That's when Ford picked Tom and brought him into his inner circle. Tom was in the inner circle of the Ford presidency. Had President Ford won, there's no doubt in my mind Tom Kane would have been in a, in a position in Washington with this president. But you're saying he didn't use that to uh, lay the foundation <coughs> for a gubernatorial run? Yeah, I was giving away state dinners to people who didn't even know they were going to state dinners. They were going to state dinners for, uh, for uh, who was the prime minister of, of uh, Egypt at the time who was assassinated? So yeah, Anwar Sadat. I was. I had. I had all these. I had these invitations for a, t a dinner with Anwar Sadat. I said we could do this, this, and this. He said no. I need it for this, this, and this. I need it for this delegate, that delegate. I need to make sure this is taken care of. It was all for Ford because he felt he was in a fight. He never did anything to help himself in that process because we could have come out of that. Even, even though Bateman was by far Senator Bateman was by far the 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 favorite to run in, in 1977, we could have at least began to build some support. Never did anything Why for it. Why do you think that is? Because it's the way he is. I mean, he, 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 you know how everybody likes to take, uh, likes to think two or three steps ahead in politics. You know, if I win this, this Senate seat and state Senate, then I can go into Congress and then I, then I have a shot at the Senate and the United States. Tom doesn't think like that he, because he knows, I mean, you know, in this world, especially nowadays, Politics is like, you know, a month is like a year. Uh, back, when, in back then, it was slower, but not now. I mean, but he also knew that if you did well, if you did well, we won in New Jersey. Now, we lost the big, the big kahuna in the sense of winning the presidency, but we won, and that in itself laid the foundation for him in 1977 to a degree. The fact that he was one politically astute, everybody, you know, they knew they had, they had somebody that they had to deal with in 1977. But they, you know, they, federal races, 
state races, I mean, that's like night and day. I mean, those are like two different worlds. The people in the dealing with the states, they know what they're doing, and they don't, they don't even focus on the federal candidates. That's why we have senators who go in there and stay there for 24, 18, 24 years, and we don't even know what they do. During his interview here for the Brendan Byrne Archive, John Degnan criticized Tom Kane for not helping uh, pass an income tax uh, relative to other members of the Republican caucus like Wayne Dumont. Do you have any comment on that? He, he that was just was not his style to push uh, certain people. And Wayne would be someone that he wouldn't, I don't think he would push in one way or another. But I, I think that's probably legitimate. I think that's probably as legitimate. I think that Tom, um, Tom hedged on that, on that income tax for a long time. And uh, Tom always had, had a certain perspective of New Jersey remaining competitive with New York and Pennsylvania. And he was always looking at data that really made those, especially as governor, even more so as governor. You, did, you wanted to remain competitive. You wanted New Jersey to be more competitive than these other states because the, he felt some of them were you know, just killing themselves in terms of taxation. And he just wanted to keep it. But he did not push. He felt that an income tax a tax issue, a tax vote, is so individualistic, and it's, it, that person has to bring it back to his district. They should have the freedom and not be pushed. You know, nowadays, I mean, it's all this, the party this, the party this, the party. Tom didn't feel, he didn't push. He said, these are the issues. He laid it out in caucus, but he let them make a decision. If they could carry it back to their district, then they should go ahead and vote for it, if they felt they should. What did the primary in 77 turn on what uh, what was it about basically I mean in the primary which is what we dealt with was it was money um, and I, th I think people should understand that Tom Kane was the first the first gubernatorial candidate to be on television in a primary to be on radio in a primary and and I think I think what were the other first that we had in that in that race? I think, well, I know it was television, and I know it was radio. Early on in a campaign, we were we were just starting the whole new trend in politics here in New Jersey. Back in the old days, it was all the county organizations, the flag, the you know the bumper stickers, the signs on the lawn, all of that. Tom, we well, first of all, we had to go around the organization. We couldn't wait for the organization to take care of us because Bateman basically had all of them. We disrupted some of the organization stuff, but basically we had to go around them. So we used radio very early. We used television uh, very early, and those were all unique. And we had a great slogan, burned up, let's raise Cain. <laughs> uh, how did Tom Cain position himself against Ray Bateman? What was he offering that distinguished him from <coughs> Bateman? Just like, just like in today's world, it was, it was all economics, then it was all taxes. And basically, Tom said he would let the vote go. He would not um, take a position, and he would, he would actually allow the people to decide whether or not they wanted income tax. He would take it to a vote. I remember when, when he came back from the Passaic County Organization Committee meeting, and he came into my office, which is in this dungeon down in <laughs> Springfield, and... Springfield, New Jersey, and he came in and he said, you know, Bateman just jumped off the cliff. He said, no new taxes. And he said, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> and because we went to the edge of the cliff and said, uh, we'll put it to a vote. But Bateman just jumped right over him and said to the Passaic County organization that we will, he, will, he will backtrack on the state income tax. And that's what we knew he would lose the campaign. And that's what we knew, we, you know, we, how are we going to win this campaign? That's when you knew that Bateman would lose the general election? General election. But win the primary. Well, lose the general election, that, that's probably a bold statement. You don't know how that, you don't know how Brendan was going to play on some of those issues. But, but I knew he was in a box. In a, in, in a campaign, you can't get in a box. The, I mean, this president, uh, this president is one of the most masterful campaigns I've ever seen run in the, in, in the country. You're talking about the current president. The current Obama. president. President Obama ran you know, it, just a masterful campaign, not only in 
not only in keeping his themes and also variations of his themes together, but he stayed above the fray. He didn't get down deep into some of the, some of the issues, but most importantly, he didn't get boxed in. He didn't get boxed into an issue where he, he can't work his way out once he gets the reins of power. And Ray was, he just said he was, you know, he would, he would, uh, he would get, the con get the legislature to revoke the uh, income tax. What kind of personal relationship did Tom Kane and Ray Bateman have? Very respectful of one another. I, I really think they've always been friends. It, it gets tough when, you, when you're in a campaign. I remember um, I said to Tom after the race, and it was really all the, you know, it came down to the last month. On, on the first week in May of uh, 1977, Tom Kane was 20 points ahead of Ray Bateman. Literally, we were 41-21. And uh, it, was, it was not... You thought you were going to win the primary? No, we knew we had, a, we had a tough month ahead of us. And it all depend. And I knew I was running out of money. Uh, and I knew, I knew Ray had the ability to get the money if he needed it. And that's what he did. He went and got a million dollars from all his friends who signed on a note and uh, outspent us on television and ended up winning. And we lost 51-38. Uh, and it, <coughs> we just couldn't sustain what we had started early in circumventing the party. We could not sustain it all the way through. And also, some of our ads were not as, as effective, I thought, in, in the latter part. But Ray, uh, Ray got the money and, and focused in the, May, the month of May when everybody... And also, the organization wanted him to win. I mean, we were the outsiders. We were long shots to begin with, but we thought we actually had a chance. Ray was senior to Kane. Uh, yes. He was older. Yes. Uh, he had been in the legislature longer. He was in the upper house. Right. It was really his turn, was it not? It was. I mean, Tom was looked at as as uh, kind of an upstart on something like this, and so we knew it was. We knew it. We, you know, we were we were. Uh, this was a reach for us, but I do think I do think he felt. He could he could move the state forward in, in in a better way. He just had a lot. He felt he had better ideas, and it, in bringing it away from the party a little bit, a little more independent, he thought it would be effective to to make the run. And if you won it, you had so much flexibility. It would have been unique. Did you take a leave for, to run the campaign? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you were you the campaign manager? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you left Merck in order to run. The yeah, campaign? I had to leave Merck in order to do that. Uh, was Albert Merck someone you interacted oh, yeah. with? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Al and I were good friends. Uh, he was actually, uh, after, this is going back a little bit, 1974, after 19, 1974, um, the race, the congressional race, Al said, can you come and run the freeholders races in Morris County? Al was the campaign manager to all the county candidates, and I ran... Rodney Freeling has in, uh, Rodney Freeling has and Eileen um, McCoy and Gary Garofalo and uh, John Fox's race for sheriff. Uh, I ran their race and, and Al was the campaign manager and, and I ran the campaigns before I got the job at Merck. And Al Merck was involved in politics. Was he a legislator or? He was a legislator for a short period of time, yes. And also a, a, an executive at Merck? No, no. He was on the board. He was on the board. He was on the board he at Merck. He was Martin. from the family. He was from the family, yeah. Okay. And I think he still has, uh, still involved with the family foundations and things like that. Who else were key figures uh, in the 77 primary campaign? There really, we had, we had no real key figures. Uh, it was just a small young crowd that ran the race out of the, there were a couple of uh, Phil Kaltenbacker was involved, I think, and a friend. And, but we had, we had no real key figures. And that's the other thing. That's one thing that I found interesting. You know, a lot of the people who should have known Tom Kane, a lot of the business people in the Newark communities and things like that, none of them supported uh, Tom Kane. I mean, they were all walked away from that. But Bateman had all the key people, all the political county chairmen. Uh, there were no real powerhouses behind us in that campaign. What uh, posture did Kane assume after losing the primary? He, he, we both sat down and he said, you know, I'll let you know when we should, when we should do something. And about August, after 
after everything was uh, everything had calmed down a little bit, he, I waited for him to go in. He walked into the Bateman administration, Bateman campaign office, and sat down with Ray and talked with Ray. And actually, that's when everything. And then I came in and said I'd help. We all helped as much as we could. We did a lot of work in in the primary. When did it become obvious to you that Bateman was not going to be successful? Well, it was. It's just those debates, and also then that that plan. When the plan came out, it was the you know the Bateman Simon plan, and it was just became known as the BS plan, and and then it was just uh, you know you couldn't justify it, you couldn't even defend it, and then it became very difficult. The media just just went crazy on it, which was understandable because it just it there was no rationale for it. You know, it's like you know it's it's sort of like moving ahead i mean what what brendan did was m move the state ahead because it needed to do some things he might have did it with a vehicle that somebody else would have done it with a different vehicle, whatever but the point is is that i knew once that plan came out it was just uh it was going to be very difficult to defend all right well we want to know uh, what happened between 77 and 81 both in tom kane's career and in your life <laughs> but we're going to save that uh for a change of tape. Okay, good. <laughs> After the gubernatorial election of 77, in which Brendan Byrne was reelected, what did you do? I started my own company at that time. Um, I had uh, decided that I, I, well, I couldn't go back to Merck because I, I couldn't take another, I, I took one leave of absence to run the Ford campaign and they accepted me back after that and then I took another leave of absence and they said, no, you can't take, like, we, need, we need help in this position so I couldn't go back to Merck because uh, they went and hired somebody but I decided to start my own company at that time and actually was involved in lobbying a little bit but also corporate communications. I mean, one of the things I learned in corporate life is that when it comes to a public issue, corporations have a hard time circling around it inside the company. See, it's easier to use outside people to help and then they can, the people inside the company, there aren't any incentives for people to go out on a limb on public issues, let's put it that way. They can deal with their own business issues, but when it came to something on the public side, it was very difficult for corporations to set up incentives, even if you had government affairs people in your office. No one would really take it. So consulting became a, a real opportunity. So I took that. I got my, my uh, I got a client, one client uh, very early on from Exxon, uh, friends of mine at Exxon. But then I got involved indirectly on Wall Street. And that's when my company started to take off. Uh, I started doing financial communications, which involved a lot of uh, interesting writing and as well as some very tough issues. Basically on the basis, the New York Mercantile Exchange had a potato futures contract and they were in the middle of a fraud because somebody tried to corner the market on potato futures. But that was going on as they were developing and finalizing oil futures. And they were just about ready to introduce oil futures when this, when this fraud hit and Senator Muskie in Washington wanted to shut the exchange down. So a little inside story. You'll like this one because it's, it crosses, crosses uh, Democratic and uh, Republican and Democratic circles. I get called in because a friend of mine knows I'm involved and they, they need help in Washington. So we go and we, we went up to Maine and we dealt with the farmers in Maine and then we went and testified before Congress with Senator Muskie who was very upset with the exchange, calmed him down a little bit. And then they fired the CEO of the exchange. So they said, we need to get somebody in here that can take us with this oil thing. So I run into Dick Leone out of just somewhere. I can't remember exactly what it was. If, if I don't know if I'd seen him somewhere or something. And I called uh, Dick and said, what are you doing? And he said um, he was doing something. I don't know if he was doing something at Princeton or something like that, but he, he was consulting and he had some things going on. But I said, you know, have you, 
you know the New York Mercantile Exchange at all? And he said, uh, no, he didn't know anything about it. So I said, well, look it up and find out a little bit about it because <laughs> I'm going to call you on this. So I went back to the chairman who was a friend of mine, a young guy. These guys, these traders are all young. And uh, I said, you know, there's this guy that really has good, understands economics, understands uh, these markets, uh, has a background, he was treasurer of New Jersey, all of this sort of stuff. I said, we should, should think about him for chairmanship. He says, well, I know that guy. I, I had him in class in Princeton. So brought him in and he got the job. And it was helpful to me basically because I needed to deal with Muskie and we had to calm him down and, and Dick, Dick had a lot of connections there. And then Dick was great. Dick really knew um, uh, or learned very quickly. You know, he's a quick study. And you could imagine Dick Leone on the floor with the traders. It was just so wonderful to watch. <laughs> it was, you know, he doesn't suffer fools too, too, too long, and uh, you know, traders are an interesting breed unto themselves. Uh, but he did a very good job, got the exchange, got the heating oil contracts going, and actually created a market to where it's now uh, one of the largest exchanges uh, in the country. Did you have a partner in your business? Yes. Who was your partner? Um, a fellow Ohio State grad, uh, John Neiswanger, I talked him into coming out from Columbus. He had a firm out in Columbus. And I, f I talked him into coming out in 1981. And uh, we've been in business since, well, 30, 32 years now. And where did you set up your business? In Rahway. I had. You know, I was there at Merck, and uh, Rahway is sort of centrally located. You can get down to Trenton pretty easily, get into New York pretty easily. You have all those trains that come into Raw. Rahway is the last station. The trains go down to the shore, and the trains go down to Princeton. So there are a lot of trains that end up in Rahway. So we just stayed in Rahway. Where did you live at the time? In Rahway. It was a f you know, when I went to work for Merck, <laughs> And the guy at HR said, well, you know, where are you going to live? And I said, I'm probably going to live here in Rahway. He said, why? And I said, well, it's because it's where I work. And he said, well, I mean, there's New York. And, you know, my, my boss, the boss I reported to, lived in Philadelphia. But I, I'm, I'm from the Midwest. You know, we, we, sometimes we like to walk to work <laughs> in the Midwest. So it was a little different experience for me. But I, I lived right in Rahway. And where do you live today? Today I live in, in Plainfield, uh, not that far, but still central, get around pretty quickly. What did Tom Kane do after the gubernatorial election of 77? That was the, that was the interesting thing. What, what can he do in this time to maintain his, um, well, his respect among the party people and do things? Basically, he just pulled back a little bit and stopped because let the party sort of assimilate what had happened in 77 and the fact that Bateman lost. I mean, there was a lot of, the party was very upset and there was a lot of consternation on that. They should have never lost all this sort of stuff. So that he sort of stayed away from all of that and then never fully really got back into it because he took a position on New Jersey Network. And basically, I mean, it's, it's, it goes to show you how clever he is. I mean, I, I was thinking him, point, counterpoint. You know, what are you talking about here? You know, New Jersey Network. And, you know, yes, I know that the, the inside crowd looks at that. But, I mean, how broad can you get? Well, what hap it was fortuitous in many ways. They did a point, counterpoint. Dick Leone and Tom King. And they did it at the very end of the show. And at the end of the show was when they called the lottery numbers. Everybody in the state listened to these two people talk and debate these issues, and then they called them, then they listened to the lottery number. It was like he would get he would go out and speak at different things, and everybody would say, "Oh yeah, I see you, I see you on uh, with the lottery number." How often do you think they were on? Once or twice a week? Yeah, but it was good. I mean, those two. You know, if I could do a show with those two, I would do it in a minute. I mean, bright, interesting, can absolutely take it down so that everybody understands what they're talking about, bring in all the various two best, you know, debaters you'll ever see. And good, sometimes they agree, sometimes they disagree. 
good, good, very effective speakers. Yeah, I agree with you. I re I, that's when I came to New Jersey. Right. And I remember watching those two right. guys, and they were a very intelligent set of commentators. And, and, and the issues they dealt with, there weren't any that too complicated for them to deal with. It was, it, and, and taxation in particular, Dick Leone was very effective as treasurer in, in moving the whole, the whole tax issue forward for Brendan. How did you view Brendan Byrne in those days? Did you see a change in Brendan Byrne from the first to the second term, for example? I, I didn't actually. I mean, I thought, you know, this is a governor that just hit big issues, and he hit them and took them head on. I mean, I, I'll tell you, the, more so than the tax issue, Pinelands was unbelievable. That Pinelands bill had every lobbyist in Trenton hired to fight it. I mean, just took it straight on, and, and he knew how important it was. People don't know all the, all the internal fighting with that one. Were you because involved in that fight? no, I wouldn't. I didn't have a client in that one, but I watched it, and that was. I mean, first of all, all the southern guys hired all the northern guys to fight. <laughs> I mean, Jimmy Dugan and a lot of the. I mean, there were some big heavyweights uh, in the Democratic Party that were were taking that issue on, and that's a million. That's a million acres of land to protect. I mean, that was not. You have. You had to hurt somebody. <laughs> With that much land, twenty percent of the land mass of yeah. the state. So that, I mean, I I thought, you know, he he w he wasn't weakened. Uh, I thought, the, first of all, I thought the campaign was masterful. I thought that, and that was Dick Leone and David Garth. And David and I became good friends after that because I really wanted David to run Tom's campaign because uh, I didn't like Bailey and Durdorf. That's a long story. But uh, David and I would talk about that campaign a lot. And basically, it was a very controlled campaign. It was just Dick and David. And Brendan essentially, uh, uh, you know, waited for those two to make decisions and and but Brendan was good I mean he had the right instincts as well I mean he's not he wasn't the kind of governor he was out there um, and but he took on the tough issues there's no doubt about that not only the income tax and then I don't even know um, when the casinos come in was that Six, so it was just before it was just before the run I thought that was a good I thought that was a good thing to do too I wish they had made that you know, we've talked about this. Brendan and I, have t I wish that they had done something with Atlantic City and made it somewhat like the uh, Hackensack Meadowlands Authority because it just, it's just not functional to put a big industry like that into a town like that. But that's, you know, that's hindsight. Uh, what kind of relationship did Tom Kane have with Brendan Byrne after 77? It was very, very cordial, very respectful. I think it just was a different it was a different era they took on issues they took on the people and th and we might have even had a cute little slogan like burned up let's raise cane um, but I there was respect i mean they they weren't hurting people like they do today where they they actually i mean it's it's you know just driven into the the negative side to the point where that's all you think about is negative and there were enough negatives for Brendan in terms of a tax issue, which is of high priority. In a campaign, there, there are primary issues and secondary issues. When, it's, when taxes and the economy are primary issues, you know, there aren't many other issues that get discussed. And that was, that was what was out there with people. And they, they did it in a very, I think, in a very respectful way. And I think Tom did, too. Uh, did Governor Byrne appoint Tom Kane to the Highway Authority in that period. He of did. Time? He did afterwards. It, it, uh, he appointed him to the Highway Authority, and he enjoyed that. And I think he enjoyed it basically because you know the Highway Authority has the Garden State Arts Center, <laughs> and he loved the music and he loved all of that that they had at the Garden State Arts Center. Did Tom Kane have to work? Uh, at something <coughs> in 78, 79. Yes, he did. He was working, actually working real estate that time. And he was uh, developing land that the family had owned. And so he was, he was pretty active then and complained quite a bit about environmental laws. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> he would say, I don't understand all these. I said, those are ones you passed. You know that? Those are the ones you wrote. Uh, and he would complain about this, that, or the other thing. But 
he he did some he did some residential here in New Jersey as well as well as um, down in Florida. He had some they had some land, but he was doing he was doing some work. Was he plotting another run for governor all this time? Not really. Um, there was there was there was the remnants there that we had, and the fact that he that he had received 37 percent of the vote in the primary the last time. So there was a core there that w would have liked to have seen him start something. But he didn't because of his television responsibility. And you had to remain neutral if you were in that position. And uh, that's how he got to the, the 1980 uh, convention. He went as a, he, he, he went as a, uh, actually a telecaster for NJN. And he did interviews at, at the Republican convention when Reagan got the nomination. That's how he got, uh, and, and they used a lot of the footage for that, from basically from him. But he was not, was not politically active at Had that time. Had he been a candidate, or clearly positioning himself as a candidate, NJM would have felt obliged to Absolutely. take him off the air. Absolutely. Anything like that. He did nothing to... And I was quietly, we had all of our material, we had organization, we had to think about who we would have run the campaign. I was busy with my company at that time. All of those things were going on. Uh, but then, after the, after the Reagan uh, election, that's when we started thinking about it. Others from the Kane family uh, were active in New Jersey business circles at the time. Uh, tell us about uh, John Kane and Robert Kane and uh, who they were and what they did. Well, John Kane is the cousin. Uh, he is head. He was head of the um, uh, Elizabethtown Gas Company, and that is his cousin. I mean, Tom's father, and. John's father were brothers. Uh, John Kane and, and Robert Kane were brothers, and John was a cousin. They were on the gas company side. Bob Kane was Tom's brother, and he's on the water side. And, and uh, they were always, uh, both families were, were active in the, in the utility business and, and active in business community. They were very involved in the areas that they served. And John Kane in particular was was active internationally. He was very active in the American Gas Association and all those trade associations at that time when all those issues were being debated internationally as well as nationally. And who, uh, who was fighting for the 1980 Republican presidential nomination? Uh, Ronald Reagan. Who, who was running it? Do you recall who? Well, George Bush. George Bush. Um, was Rockefeller in that? Mix? No. No, no. Those were the those those were the, two? Those were the principles. So who did Tom <coughs> Kane? Well, that's right. You're saying he was neutral. He was neutral. He was a commentator. He was a commentator at that he time. He didn't have to take a. Position. He didn't have to take a position. Yeah, and there was, there was a, um, basically the Reagan people came into New Jersey and did a very good job. That was Roger Stone at the time, who came into New Jersey and and actually did a fairly good job in organizing and getting uh, some of the conservative. Uh, part of the the, the uh, party together. Did Reagan win the New Jersey presidential primary? Do you recall? Well, he got the nomination. Uh, did he get the delegates? Yeah. You know, I can't remember specifically on that. All right. So now we're up to November of 1980. We're a year away from a gubernatorial run. Um, what happens to set in motion? A gubernatorial run. You have a meeting. Uh, you, 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 what happens? Now we start thinking about it seriously, and then there was one thing that Brendan Byrne did that made the the opportunity to run for governor even that much greater. He opened up the primary, and that was a piece of legislation that that just you know made the uh, from a Kane perspective. We had a base from 1977 that we can draw on. And everybody came into the race. I mean, there were people coming from places we never, we never heard of. Bo Sullivan, uh, Joseph Bo Sullivan came out of nowhere, had a big party at the, at the convention that Tom went to. Uh, uh, but 
We didn't know politically, you know, what he was all about, but he came out of the blue. Pat Kramer, um, mayor of Patterson. And then there were six or seven others, including Tony Imperiali, who, who were, were in the race. I mean, it was, it was amazing uh, how many people got in the race and won it. And it was open. That meant that the county chairman couldn't decide who to put on their, on the line. It well, was what separated. What, it was separated. It was separated from the line that was used by the county. And counties. why did Brendan Byrne do that? He opened it up for his friend, John Degnan. <laughs> and that was, that one thing alone opened it up for Tom Kane. If Brendan Byrne did anything for Tom Kane, it was, it was that one thing that, in trying to help uh, another friend, he helped Tom Kane tremendously. And Tom always remembered that too. And who was the key? Who, who were the front runners for the Republican gubernatorial nomination? Well, you know that's the interesting thing. Pat Kramer and and Bo Sullivan was, but Tom always said, you know, don't count out Pat Kramer, because Pat Kramer, you, you know, see this is this is kind of an interesting thing, Michael, and it's something that uh, you know that I would have a hard time with. Because I knew business people, and I, I worked in business, and I saw all this, but business people couldn't identify with Tom Kane. They couldn't, they couldn't get, they couldn't necessarily feel that he was going to be the kind of guy that would fight for them. You know, if if it was a tough issue, or if it, you know, and I always felt that, you know, why do you need that, you business people? Why do you need? Why don't you just know that the guy is good, and smart? And Kanana, why do you have to have a sense of knowing that you can take him into that gray area, you know, that the business world sometimes plays in? I used to get frustrated with that. That entire Newark community, all the Bobs and the Paul Stillman. I told Tom Kane, if he ever speaks to Paul Stillman again, that guy had us running around with, and this was a big shot, you know, this was Mr. Newark. He was chair of National State Bank. He was the president of one of the big insurance. I, I can't remember all the things, but he was, he was Mr. Newark. None of them supported Tom Kane. They all went with Pat Kramer. So I said to them, I said, if you ever talk to him, well, and this, this will tell you a little bit about Tom Kane. About the third year out in his gubernatorial race, he came to me, you know, he says, it's time to run again. You know, maybe I should talk to Paul Stillman now. <laughs> And I said, hey, it's up to you. But, you know, I, I could never understand why the business community can't see that. But they always have to have a little, a little something. You know, it's, it's, it's what's wrong with business in this country. Just know that you have a good guy in there. And you're not necessarily going to get everything that you want. But have somebody in there that has the fundamental ideals that you're looking for. And then support them. But no. They have to know that there, you know, there's a deal somewhere, or maybe they have, you know, they that that go that governor knows where he, they are on an issue or something like that. It's just, it just, it just, just get the right leader. I couldn't convince people that Tom could win a general election, and that was always a difficult thing. They looked at him. They looked at him differently than I did, and that was my that was my problem, is that I could see where he could not only win if he got through a primary, definitely win a general election. Because I could see he could appeal to a broader, a broader base. No one saw that but me. And that was the convincing thing that, that uh, needed to be made in the campaign.